morning, ladies and gentlemen. I applaud all of you for taking time from your busy schedules to consider the impact of Watergate on this, the 30th anniversary of the event. I especially thank my friend Lou Fry for organizing this symposium as it touches upon truly important events in our nation's history. Conferences such as these provide us the singular opportunity to pause in our busy lives to consider important political events, and Watergate is arguably the most significant political event of the last 30 years. Watergate has had far-ranging implications, not only for the administration of government, but also for the nation overall. Implications that are still with us today in the political process. I trust you will find the symposium interesting, if not compelling at times. And if this were not a true story, I'm sure some novelists would have to work hard to make it as interesting as the real facts are. Let me begin by saying that I had no advance notice that I'd be cho chosen as the senior Republican on the Watergate Committee. At the time that that occurred, I was on a congressional delegation visiting in Russia, and I was at the American Embassy residence there when I received word that I had been asked to take this appointment. Remember that in 1973, the U.S. Senate majority was Democratic, and Republicans were in the minority. So my friend, Senator Sam Irvin of North Carolina, who was a Democrat, was chosen as chairman, and I was elected as vice chairman. Our charge was to investigate presidential campaign practices in 1972. But really, the charge of the committee was to look into the break-in of the Democratic headquarters at the Watergate complex and other allegations of illegal practices at that time. And I have to tell you that when the committee was created, I had a strong view that the whole thing was a Democratic dirty trick calculated to embarrass newly reelected President Nixon. As the senior Republican on the committee, my first act was to request a meeting with President Nixon, uh, and I met with him in his office in the old executive office building. And when we were together, I said, Mr. President, I'm going to be the senior Republican on this newly formed committee, and I'm determined to protect your interests. Toward the end of the meeting, I remarked casually, I hope that my old friend, Attorney General John Mitchell, whom I'd known for years, uh, doesn't have any, any problems. And to my surprise, President Nixon said, well, he might have some problems. And that was the first time I began thinking, you know, Baker, there's more to this than you know. And I decided to proceed with the inquiry on a nonpartisan, objective basis and to just follow the facts wherever they led me. And as a result, I was criticized in and out of the Senate for not being perhaps a stronger advocate of the president's position and of the Republican Party. It's, a, it's good to recall the prominent attention our committee meetings received. In addition to the extensive, extensive coverage of the newspapers, I remember the day when my staff member told me that all three commercial networks and PBS were giving gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the hearings and that Maybe 125 million people were watching. It's a breathtaking statement. But, you know, an interesting thing happened. The shock of that lasted about 30 seconds. And after that, I realized that I was absolutely oblivious to the TV coverage and was mesmerized and focused on the task at hand. To this day, I'm still amazed at how many people watched and many were riveted by the proceedings. I also recall that during the hearings, I received dozens of unsolicited neckties from, who, from people who said, we watched you on television and your necktie was terrible. But to tell you the truth, most of the neckties I received uh, in the mail were terrible too. As you know, 
The Watergate committee heard many witnesses from within and outside the administration. But a pattern of conduct began to emerge from the testimony. And it became clear to me that the hearings were really not going anywhere. They were not well organized and had no theme. We were not succeeding in conveying a coher coherent picture of what really happened in the run-up to Watergate. Reflecting that feeling that we weren't getting anywhere, one day in a meeting with my staff, I said, you know, I, I need to focus these hearings, at least in, for my part, and I'm thinking of asking the question, what did the president know and when did he know it? There was a distinct lack of enthusiasm for that formulation, and my press secretary at the time said, don't do that, that's too hokey. I posed the but I posed that question to a witness, and that question, which was devised without any preparation but what, but beyond what I just described, probably became my signature statement for which I may be always remembered and most closely associated. After we learned about the taping mechanism in the White House, it was clear to me and to my fellow committee members that it was going to be necessary to subpoena the tapes. And I was the one who made the motion. I had told Sam Irvin that, you know, these tapes are going to be political dynamite. And honestly, it would be better for a Republican to make the motion to issue the subpoena. And he agreed. And we did. And to my surprise, President Nixon finally decided to give up the tapes. And they turned out to be his undoing. It was the right thing to do, to give up the tapes. It was a good thing for President Nixon to do. But I've often wondered if he fully understood the consequences of that act. The Watergate Committee hearings were not a happy time for many, including me. Because I counted Richard Nixon as a friend. I had supported him in his campaign for president. He had campaigned for me in my first race for the Senate in Tennessee. So it was difficult for me to address these issues without bias. But I felt that was the job that had to be done. That is the right thing to do. It had disastrous political consequences, as many of you know, for Republicans and for me as well. I was thoroughly criticized by many in the press and Congress and elsewhere. There are many Republicans who find it difficult to talk to me even now because I did not, in their view, uh, fervently defend President Nixon against all charges. But I never regretted my decision to follow the facts wherever they might lead me. I'm convinced it was the right course. I'm convinced that it helped define the course of the committee hearings and the country's de uh, determination on what it really meant. And when we look back and consider the lessons of Watergate, I think it's clear that Presidential candidates must assume that their statements and their conduct will receive the closest possible scrutiny. I think candidates should proceed on the assumption that there will be no secrets and that everything will appear in the newspaper and on television eventually. But most of all, I think candidates for public office, and perhaps everyone, should understand that cover-ups never work. In the final analysis, President Nixon's downfall was not the break-in and burglary of the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate complex in Washington. And while that was an illegal act, it was really a relatively minor event. The President's downfall, in my opinion, flowed from his decision to try to, uh, to, to contain these events rather than trying to liquidate them. 
I'm convinced that if President Nixon, on learning of the Watergate break-in, had decided to make a public disclosure of the involvement of White House and administration personnel, and then perhaps to go on television and announce the firing of all those involved, that he today would be thought of in an entirely different light, perhaps even as a moral giant. But he didn't. And he was removed, from, then he had to leave office. So for me, the real lesson of Watergate is face up to the facts. Assume that everything will be public. And most of all, that cover-ups never were. So from Japan, I bid you good wishes that over the next two days you will come to understand, perhaps even appreciate, this critical era in American history as the seminal event of the last 30 years in American politics. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts with you, and good wishes. Our gathering this week is timely indeed, and not just because of the approaching end, anniversary of the end of the Nixon administration. During the recent presidential primary campaign, it sometimes felt like 1972 all over again. Nearly 10 years after President Nixon's death, Howard Dean, who was running for president, denounced Richard Nixon's so-called Southern strategy, which was a little ironic since Governor Dean himself said that he wanted the votes of the guys with Confederate flags on their windshields. John Kerry told audiences at his rallies that he was proud of having stood up to Richard Nixon over Vietnam in 1971. And President Bush was questioned about his National Guard service during the Nixon administration. We rely on gatherings such as this one, among many other devices, to remind ourselves of events that otherwise would begin to slip behind the veil of memory. But evidently, we don't need reminding when it comes to Richard Nixon and the dramatic events of his presidency. In politics, in culture, in our spiritual and family lives, we tend to revisit our foundational stories, sometimes because of their power to inspire us, and sometimes because of the pain they embody. And over the next two days, we will be preoccupied with the trauma and the pain of Watergate. But I would suggest to you that when we think about the Nixon years, the subject that really bedevils us, that haunts our politics, that even influences the way leaders make decisions today about war and peace in the age of terrorism, that subject is not so much Watergate, but the war in Vietnam. In a quarter century spent working for the former president and now for his library, I've had my share of conversations and arguments about Richard Nixon. And many have begun with Watergate. Most get around eventually to Vietnam. When President Nixon ordered bombing raids and incursions into Cambodia in 1969 and 1970, was he invading a peaceful, neutral country? Or was he saving lives by taking the battle into sanctuaries that North Vietnamese troops were using to launch attacks on our troops and our allies in South Vietnam? When he ordered B-52s to attack targets in North Vietnam in December of 1972, was it the act of a maddened tyrant, as his critics said, or a lonely but necessary step to break the will of the leaders in Hanoi? and bring our prisoners of war home. After President Nixon brought an end to U.S. involvement in Vietnam with the Paris Peace Accords in January of 1973, did Saigon fall 27 months later because of the superiority and the skill of the North Vietnamese? Because history was on the side of that crushing neo-Stalinist regime? Or because the Congress of the United States let South Vietnam run out of bullets? Was Daniel Ellsberg, the Vietnam War architect turned anti-war activist who leaked the Pentagon Papers to the press? 
Was he a hero or was he a rogue? Did the United States have interests and obligations in Vietnam or did it not? These questions are still lively and painful, especially for anyone whose life and family were touched by the war. They will not be resolved by us this week. Some of us may even be saying to ourselves by this point that this is not a conference about Vietnam, but a conference about Watergate. I do suggest that because the war begat the scandal, because Watergate grew out of an argument between Americans and among Americans about the Vietnam War, history should weigh the two subjects side by side. I also suggest that Richard Nixon's historical standing is to an extent held hostage by the simmering tension flowing from these same unanswered questions. As for the specific links between Vietnam and Watergate, they are innumerable. On a purely practical level, there would have been no one to break into Democratic Party headquarters at the Watergate if the Nixon White House had not created the so-called Plumbers Unit to investigate the largest wartime national security leak in human history, the Pentagon Papers. And when President Nixon angrily ordered his aides in June 1971 to blow the safe at the Brookings Institution to find out if officials there were involved in the Pentagon Papers. It was the anger of a commander-in-chief during wartime. It's of course hard for most of us to understand what it's like to be responsible for the lives of troops under our command. Today, President Bush must bear the burden, along with their families, of losing nearly 580 courageous Americans in Iraq in a little over a year. At the height of the Vietnam War in May of 1969, that many young Americans died in five weeks. Regarding the Brookings Institution, President Nixon's anger passed. No one blew it safe. But because President Nixon's passion was preserved on tape and about 4,000 hours of things were preserved on tape, the historical Nixon is still called to account for his anger. I sometimes wonder, Congressman, how FDR might have felt in a similar moment. Think, for instance, about the siege of Corregidor in the Philippines during World War II, when Roosevelt thought he was about to lose Douglas MacArthur and his officers and the men under his command and had no way to stop it. No reinforcements were available to send. What if, at that moment, one of Roosevelt's aides had come into his office and told him that a War Department aide turned pacifist had given some pre-war Japanese cables to the press to try to weaken the case for America's war against Japan in the Pacific. Would Roosevelt have gotten angry? We may imagine so. Would history have forgiven his anger? We hope so. Yet history tends not to lump Richard Nixon with FDR, Abraham Lincoln, and Woodrow Wilson. Our young people are not taught automatically to think of him as a wartime commander in chief. When school children and high school and college students come to the Nixon Library, I often ask them for the first word that comes to their head about President Nixon. They almost always say, Watergate. I respond with carefully studied patience. That's okay, kids, I say. What's the second word that comes into your heads? If there is a second word, it is almost never Vietnam. And yet when I ask them how many of their families were touched by the war, usually a quarter of them raise their hands. I imagine I would have a similar reaction if I asked that question here. When they learn that President Nixon may have commanded their fathers and mothers, their uncles, or grandfathers, they seem to regard the displays in our museum with more alert eyes. Of course, by the time President Nixon inherited the Vietnam War in command of 550,000 young Americans who'd been sent to Indochina by his two predecessors, the elite consensus about the war's aims and prospects 
had eroded. No one who thought the war illegitimate or illegal was likely to afford Richard Nixon the latitude that most war presidents had enjoyed. By the same token, President Nixon's conceptions of his responsibilities and of the resources available to his office were not influenced by others' judgments that the war had been a terrible idea. This disconnect between the president and his critics over his war powers, rooted in a disconnect and a debate about the very morality of the war, helps explain why the aspect of President Nixon's Watergate defense that was rooted in national security was not persuasive and why it ultimately became something that people made fun of. Let me be clear. I would not ask history to excuse everything or indeed anything that Richard Nixon said or did purely on the basis that he was a war president. I merely hope history will remember that he was a war president. I hope history will construe his passions as being legitimately rooted in his profound sense of obligation to our troops and to our nation's standing and security in the world. I hope history will understand that his critics in Congress and elsewhere were subject to passions of their own that were also rooted in their beliefs about the war and America's role in the world. And I hope history will see that some in Congress pursued Richard Nixon with the same determination and even enthusiasm as Bill Clinton's Republican critics exhibited when he was impeached. So I do hope that the historical Nixon remains a work in progress. Perhaps this is just a friend's wishful thinking. Yet as the 2004 campaign amply demonstrates, and our two days together likely will, Richard Nixon continues to provoke strenuous debate. He liked to say that in politics, one thing worse than being wrong was being dull. About a politician who has been gone these 10 years, he might also have said that the worst, one worse thing than being controversial is being forgotten. And so the Fry Institute deserves thanks and praise for convening this conference dedicated to the proposition that history still has work to do. And yet one senses in some quarters the desire to pronounce a premature judgment by associating Richard Nixon directly with Watergate's two most fateful acts. And here's Senator Baker's question about what the president knew and when he knew it remains extraordinarily apt. On top of the scandal, the cover-up, the tapes, President Nixon's humiliating resignation, some seem intent on finding proof that he ordered or knew in advance of two burglaries in June of 1972 at the Watergate and in September of 1971 at the Los Angeles office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist, Lewis Fielding. Lacking proof, some writers and journalists proclaimed that he must have known about them. Such was the combative mentality of the Nixon White House, as it's remembered. And such is the combative mentality of some Nixon historians. The first of these break-ins at Dr. Fielding's office was authorized by domestic policy aide John Ehrlichman, who did not inform the president except to say that an operation had been aborted in Los Angeles. So far, there is no proof that President Nixon learned about it, learned it had occurred until the spring of 1973. This is a vital point, since the president allegedly covered up Watergate to keep the FBI from learning of the plumber's illegal activities. But if he didn't know about any illegal activities at the time the cover-up began in June of 1972, then his own account of his actions in Watergate and in the aftermath becomes much more defensible. As for the Watergate break-in itself, until last year, no one had reliably accused President Nixon of having ordered it. Then PBS broadcast a documentary in which campaign aide Jeb Magruder said that he had overheard President Nixon authorize the break-in, 
during a telephone conversation with John Mitchell when Mitchell and Magruder were together in Florida in March of 1972. Magruder's account contradicted all of his earlier writings and statements. Fred LaRue, another campaign aide, was in the meeting and he says it didn't happen. Most important, the White House tapes and logs show that President Nixon made no such phone call. The PBS producers did not seek out Fred LaRue to try to confirm Magruder's story. If they were aware that the tapes contradicted it as well, they did not say so in the broadcast. Your keynote speaker this evening, Bob Woodward, calls the Nixon White House tapes the gift that keeps on giving. It's unfortunate that PBS failed to give President Nixon the gift of the benefit of the doubt by telling its viewers that those same tapes contradicted Magruder's momentous charge. PBS was perhaps too eager to demonstrate that it had unearthed Watergate's holy grail, that it had finally proven Richard Nixon's original sin. Was Watergate indeed merely the result of Richard Nixon's nature? Or was it the culmination of a national argument about war and peace as pained and poisoned as any that had occurred in our country since the Civil War? Richard Nixon believed that vital American interests were at stake in Indochina. He also hoped that the United States would give the people of Vietnam and Cambodia the chance to live in freedom. He chose to remain in Vietnam when it would have been politically wiser to withdraw. George W. Bush believes vital American interests are at stake in Iraq. He also hopes that the United States will have given the people of Iraq the chance to live in freedom. He chose to spearhead an invasion of Iraq that it would have been politically wiser to avoid. In 2004, we once again find ourselves divided over a controversial military intervention, divided Democrat versus Republican, blue versus red, multilateralist versus unilateralist, dove versus hawk. Already the rhetoric is heated, even caustic. There's almost no doubt that history will judge President Bush largely on his decision to go to war in Iraq just as President Nixon is symbolically associated with America's devastating defeat in Vietnam. At no time since President Nixon's resignation does it seem more advisable to study Watergate with an eye to understanding how policy differences can become political, personal, and ultimately poisonous. Let us bear that in mind during our two days together and in the months leading up to the November election. Thank you. President Nixon broke my heart. I was a relatively young person who had never much been involved in politics. As I was talking to some of you before, I was a political accident. I ran at 32, got elected at 33. No one had ever talked to me about politics or government. And when I got to Washington, I started an intern program. Every high school, Evans University, Jones, all the high schools got to elect one student to live with me so they could come up and see what was going on. I became, in 1972, along with Julie Nixon Eisenhower and uh, George Bush the Elder, Lowell Weicker, I think Bill Brock, the five Nixon youth chairman in the country. And uh, we worked very hard for the president. The president had taken a personal liking to me. Why, I don't know. I certainly didn't have a heck of a lot to bring to the table. Uh, and he had uh, helped me in a lot of ways, even to the extent of moving the state party so that if I wanted to run for Senate in 73 and 74, I could have. My payoff for helping the president was to ask him to come to this university to be the speaker at the graduation. We hadn't had a speaker. We were a young university. We were just growing. And, uh, of course, I'd ask him that in 72 to come. I believe, John, it was one of his last public appearances at schools around the country because by the time he came in June of 73, 
1953, the world had fallen apart. Ehrlich, the tapes were there. Ehrlichman, his staff had resigned. There were, there were all sort of problems going on. And of course, when Air Force One comes, every member of Congress rushes to get on it. There wasn't anybody on the plane but me. No one wanted to be close to the president because it was uh, extremely dangerous uh, politically. And I wasn't particularly happy about it. And Mr. President, I'm sorry I'm saying this, but it's... <laughs> uh, and uh, he, he called me back into the, to the quarters of Air Force One, and I'll never forget it. We're talking about it. I said, Mr. President, I'm not going to run for Senate. I don't know if I can keep my congressional seat. He looked at me and pointed at me. I've told John this before. pointed his finger at me, and he said, Lou, there is no smoking gun. And uh, I have puzzled over that over the years. Uh, I have puzzled over the president who introduced cancer research, who helped write, press the Clean Water Act, uh, the Clean Air Act. Uh, I was involved because I was a scuba diver and everything. They were dumping chemicals off the uh, coast here, and we got legislation through to prevent that. We got legislation through to protect the dolphins that I got him involved. And he started NOAA. He did so many things good. He opened up the mid, the, the, the China. He, he helped with, the, with, the, with Israel and, and Egypt and brought peace. He did so many things that were good. And yet the most incredible, stupid act of, I have ever seen was covering up some idiots that broke in to a headquarters, a political headquarters. There is no information of any kind ever in a political headquarters. There is nothing, be it Republican, Democrat, or Independent, is a total waste of time to break into a political headquarters. And he only won 49 of 50 states. The only state he lost was the Republic of Massachusetts, you know. And uh, so it, it, when we went through this process, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a plot. I thought, I knew the press hated Nixon. He, he engendered incredibly strong emotions among people. And it, you either liked him or you hated him. I mean, there was no mid-ground on this deal. And uh, as this thing went along, uh, a couple of my close friends uh, were, were involved in the committee and a couple of Democrats. I couldn't believe it. And when the tapes came out, it was just like a piece of me broke. I don't know if any of you have believed in something or somebody with your whole heart and worked and worked for that person and then found that, like a Greek tragedy, that they were uh, flawed. And so I just, on a personal basis, I just wanted you to understand, I voted for Article 1 of his impeachment. And uh, the world has never quite been so white. I still believe in Santa Claus the Easter Bunny, but... Um, it truly still hurts today. But the idea of this is, is to put it in perspective because you're going to hear all the people that were here and involved in the process. And Watergate, above all, proved that our Constitution worked, that we have a rule of law, that no person, even the President of the United States, is above that rule of law. And it was a hell of a way to have to prove it. And I hope we never have to prove it again. Uh, but the system did work. And that's, uh, you know, just to feel... I guess how I feel inside. This may seem like kind of a dumb question, but if there's no information available for anybody to know at a uh, party headquarters, what would be the point of breaking in at all? Stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute, total stupidity. Uh, at the time, uh, the polls showed that there was no way that George McGovern, who, who by the way, we, I honored, was one of the ones honoring about three weeks ago as a war hero, uh, was, was no way he could win anything. And I have puzzled over the years, why would you want to break into the Democratic headquarters? I mean, any party headquarters, under any circumstances, there's basically no information there. It, it is one of the dumbest acts of our nation's history. And I, you know... I wish I knew the answer to, to, to do it. It was like the Three Stooges were loose after drinking all night. I'm not sure whether that question has been satisfactorily answered. It's one of the great uh, mysteries. Uh, uh, there are all sorts of theories, and some of them revisionist, and some of them 
uh, tending to support the idea that someone in the White House thought that Larry O'Brien had certain information about uh, uh, about uh, President Nixon or that there was interest in finding information about Larry O'Brien. I have no idea. I wasn't there. There has not yet been a satisfactory answer, and I think uh, the Congressman is as good as any. General, General Ford, pardon yep. Nixon, was yep. that the right thing to do? Yes. Why? <laughs> I advised the President uh, not to pardon him at the time. Uh, the, and uh, the President said, and by the way, the Kennedy uh, uh, Institute has given Ford the, uh, their national award for, for doing that. Uh, the country was coming apart. Everything was at a stop. I said, Mr. President, if you pardon him right now, you're going to lose the election. Uh, it just not doesn't make sense. Let it run its course and, and that. And he said, no, the country's coming apart. Nothing can stop. Nothing can get going till we do it. And so he pardoned him. And by the way, President Nixon didn't want Ford as the vice president. He wanted, uh, he wanted the uh, Governor Connolly. And we forced Ford on him in the House leadership. He was not happy with Ford. They weren't very close personally. Why uh, President Kennedy and Clinton were painted in such a positive, charismatic light compared to Nixon, and they all had their faults, and they're all coming into the public arena now. The, Why is it so good different? Good question, and we're going to have a panel on that this afternoon. But basically, the rules were different. The press had a close relationship with the White House and, and the presidents over the years. And uh, Nixon was the last, if you will, of the imperial presidents uh, that, that went along, and the rules changed. Watergate changed the rules with the press and politics. Now it's fair game. It's like a feeding, feeding frenzy. You throw blood in the water, and the press runs around, tries to kill everybody, uh, which is not bad, but you just have to know what the rules are. Before then, whether Kennedy's girlfriends or whatever, all that stuff was sort of not talked about. But now with talking radio, with television, cable, and everything. There, there are no rules, and so it's, a, it's just changed. And maybe for the better, who knows? <laughs>